welcome our next speaker, digital health futurist, Manish Junjeja. Good afternoon, login. So let's have a conversation today about what it's going to be like to stay healthy in the 21st century. So the first question I'd like to ask you, but you don't have to answer right now, I just want you to think about it during my talk and think about it later, come and find me. What does health mean to you? Because it's not a question that the doctor usually asks us. It's something they think they know what's best for us, but have a reflection upon what does health mean to you and come and find me afterwards, I'd love to hear your answers. Now, when it comes to health today, we think of healthcare, we think of doctors, we think of hospitals, drugs. Some countries invest too much, like the US, 20% of GDP, and then some countries that invest too little, like India. And then globally, we don't have enough trained workers to keep people healthy. It's a huge, huge challenge this century. And look at yesterday's news in England, where researchers forecast huge problems ahead for the National Health Service, the state-run healthcare system. And what they're calling for is disease prevention policies, things that we can do as individuals to stay healthy. So improving our diet, alcohol, stopping smoking, dealing with high blood pressure, preventing it, and physical activity. These are all risk factors that we can modify through our behavior. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're gonna be talking more now in, in the years to come about prevention and early diagnosis rather than treatment and how things are shifting. And then how this is shifting, you'll hear this more and more, is shifting from sort of health care and sick care to self-care, where you as individuals in your families and communities, you'll be given the tools, you'll be empowered to stay healthy without having necessarily to interface with the healthcare system even. It's gonna look very different. And so it's got in the attention, where is this, all these new ideas going to come from? Who's going to build these tools? Is it going to be the hospitals and governments and the traditional medical device manufacturers? Or actually, it's going to be people who are in the computing industry, the tech giants. So IBM are investing money and saying, well, we can fix healthcare alone just with our technology. And there was an article published in the UK about asking, can startups save the NHS? Because again, the ideas that are going to change this century and how we stay healthy, they're not likely to come from these large traditional organizations that built the systems in the 20th century. They're going to come from people like you, young people with fresh ideas, startups who are not afraid to dream of a different future. Now, even Apple, for example, you think of Apple, you think of iPhone, iPad, but they're, they're actually got a, just, they've got a team working on trying to track diabetes, i.e. your blood sugar, using a, a, a new device or some new software. So you think again about Apple saying, wow, that's a new uh, area for us, and, and they're not afraid to start investigating. Same with Google now, they're using Google Brain, and they're thinking we can predict when you're going to get sick, so think about it. These are not organizations that are traditionally viewed as healthcare players, and so there's a lot of resistance to change many people in healthcare saying why the hell would I deal with Apple they're not a healthcare company and when you look at the opportunities again for you here in Lithuania and the Baltics and generally globally this uh, chart is from Rock Health in the US so they run uh, an accelerator out uh, in San Francisco and what they've shown over the last few years through their data is that actually the venture funding for digital health which is the area I research has gone up over the last few years huge amounts of money being thrown. And when I mean huge, look at this guy, right? This is Ali Parsa. He's not a doctor, a medical doctor. He started a startup called Babylon in London a few years ago. He's just his uh, latest round of funding, $60 million he raised. And what has he developed? He's developed a symptom checker app that you can use on your phone, and it's powered by AI in the cloud, and you can get some answers in terms of what might be wrong to you without necessarily visiting a doctor, calling somebody, visiting a website, it's all on your phone. So if you think about the power of that, in terms of shifting, again, from system-centered care to self-care, you could even potentially be in Africa in a village. As long as you have access to a phone, and a data connection, you could get access to some level of healthcare. So again, when you think about that global shortage of healthcare workers and how just a normal smartphone with this new software and what's happening in the background can change things. 
And here's an example of two pharma companies. So you've got Hikma and you've got Astellas. And think about a pharma company. They've set up their own VC fund just to invest in these new digital health solutions. So they're so desperate for innovation, they're looking to see whether one of you in the audience today could have the next big idea and they want to back it. They want to bring it in-house. They want to spot it first before any of their rivals do. So again, huge amounts of interest, huge opportunity for each of you. And also, I'm really passionate about the fact that when we think about where innovation comes from, it's not even startups that are going to help. It's actually patients themselves as innovators. And I've been meeting a lot of them. These are two people in England who are friends of mine. The lady on the left is called Molly Watt. She was born with a, a rare genetic disorder, Usher syndrome. She's deaf and blind, but she's using Apple's technology. She's actually advising them on how to build uh, better tools in terms of consumer technology from Apple for people who are deaf and blind. Right? On the right, you have a chap called Michael Ceres, um, who had a bowel transplant in the UK, and he had some problems in hospital with in terms of how they were monitoring him. So he actually went, he was so frustrated by the problems in the system after his surgery, he went and created some sensors and he set up a company and he's now moved to the US in California. So think about it. Patients themselves and their families are so frustrated that they're actually creating solutions for themselves. They're not going to wait for these large traditional systems to respond. And again, this is a really great article. Uh, I recommend you read it. It's a chap called Tal Goldsworthy. So the World Economic Forum reported on him. He's an engineer himself, but he had a life-threatening heart condition. His surgeon had kind of given up on how to uh, do this surgery. And he used 3D printing, uh, a technology available to us all, to help his surgeon create the solution for his surgery. Think about that. It's almost like where patients are equals their partners rather than these, these passive entities who just listen to whatever the doctor says. In terms of probably the poster child for digital health. If any of you have ever been to hospital or you've had a family member who's had a suspected abnormal heart rhythm, atrial fibrillation, uh, you, might, they, you might have gone for a checkup where they put the electrodes on your, on your chest, you have to visit the doctor, it's time consumer, it's expensive. What if you could do that at home with your mobile phone, just with your iPhone or your Android phone, with a little sensor that you stick on, you put your fingers on it, a 30 second recording, it's clinically validated, approved by the FDA in the US and in the EU, available to buy from Amazon, and you can just use it with your mobile phone and be able to detect whether you have an abnormal rhythm or not without a cardiologist needed to decide whether you need to go to the hospital. So if you think about that shift of moving healthcare out of the hospital into the home, and again, this will require a lot of work that involves people like you. It's not just the doctors who need to be involved. It's software developers. It's uh, designers. So think about that again. And actually, you know, we're, this, we're at the start of this big shift here. Sensors are going to be everywhere. Now, how many of you are going to be drinking alcohol at the party tonight? Because I know last night when I went out, I heard that Lithuanian people, they enjoy their alcohol. Now... What if, at the moment, nobody knows how much you drink. You don't have to tell anyone, right, when you go home. Nobody knows how many bottles of beer you drank. What if there was a sensor on your arm that could track how much you're drinking in real time? And there was a challenge. It's already happened as a prototype. It was a challenge from the US government and agency, primarily for tackling alcohol abuse. But they've now issued a second challenge, which are free to enter, by the way. And they're even thinking now that Ordinary people like us might want to use a wearable sensor to keep track of how much we're drinking. But think about that. If we've got that patch on our arm and we're tracking something, it might not be a patch, it might be a wearable on your wrist. But imagine a world, a future where your doctor, your health insurer, your employer, your family members, your friends could easily know how much you're drinking in real time. Maybe what if the bartender system knows in the future and you've had too much, you've gone over your doctor's agreed limit and the bartender says, sorry, your wearable told me I can't give you any more beer tonight. This is the, the winning um, entrant from the first challenge, uh, Backtrack. So they've created this uh, um, wearable here. So the, imagine in the future, log in, say, in, in the year 2027, in 10 years' time, and the wristbands they issue are ones that also track your alcohol consumption. Would that be cool or creepy? 
Now, think about flying, right? Many of us fly regularly for business, for pleasure. It's quite cheap to fly now. This is just an idea, but it shows you how people are thinking in terms of organizations about health and who's going to be helping us stay healthy this century. So British Airways have filed a patent for an ingestible sensor. So they're talk talking about a scenario in the future, potentially, if the technology evolves. You would board the plane, they'd give you a sensor, you'd swallow it. And in real time, the cabin crew would know how you're feeling, how your gut is reacting, the state of your body, before you even know it, because that sensor is tra send tra uh, sending data up to the cabin crew in real time as you're sitting there on your flight. Again, is that cool or creepy? Audi, I know, are a partner of Login. I had a ride in one of their wonderful cars yesterday, and their cars are going to be even more wonderful. Audi are looking at their research, they're looking at something called Fit Driver, and where the car cares for you. So imagine a world where, again, that shift outside of hospitals and the healthcare system and doctor's office, you're driving in your car, and it's read the data from your wearable, it's monitoring you as you drive, and for example, it might change the ambient lighting, it might change the, the, the radio to something a bit more uh, peaceful, it might even f detect that you're feeling tired, and to pr reduce the risk of an accident, the car says, hey, Manish, why don't you pull over at the next rest area in one kilometer? Again, how do you feel about that? Cool or creepy? Um, same with Toyota. They're looking at, actually, they've filed a patent where they're looking at a system where when you put in your, uh, your um, uh, uh, address for your satellite navigation, it's read data from your wearable in terms of your Fitbit, how much you've walked, etc., what your daily goals are. Then when you're selecting, it's selecting the route for you, it will select a route that will end up you uh, arriving maybe one kilometer away from your destination so you can walk those extra 2,000 steps to meet your daily goal. Or it may even suggest if you've got knee problems and you need to walk up and down stairs, it may even suggest, hey, why don't you, at the end of your journey, park in this parking garage on the 10th floor so you can get those joints moving. Again, sensors everywhere. Smart canes being developed in France where if you're an old person and you're at risk of falling, you're about to fall over or it detects how you're walking uh, in terms of the pressure you're putting on the cane and then it can know in advance actually you are, the, the risk of you falling is increasing and, risk, uh, and actually falling is a huge medical problem in terms of cost, the pain for people. So again, that's things to tackle there. There's belts. Who likes eating? I mean, everybody likes eating, right? And sometimes we eat too much but there's a belt that's a spin-off from uh, Samsung and Korea called Welt and it's actually a belt with sensors that not only tracks how much you walk, but it tracks how much your waist expands after you eat too much. And again, that's potentially being sent to all these organizations that care for you. Okay, um, sorry, right slide now. And then um, think about sensors again. I've got these spectacles here, they're a prototype. They've got Fitbit type sensors in them, so they track my steps and my activity and how much I've walked. So again, if you think about this future where at the moment we might have a a, a step tracker to count how much we walk that's a separate device, but what if these sensors just integrate into the devices we already own or wear? Then the, the last two articles on the bottom are really interesting. At the moment, we all have taken medicine at some point in our life as a tablet, and what if those tablets had chips in them that can send a signal out to the cloud so that people can know remotely that you have taken the pill at the right time? So, Again, this is a company called Proteus out in Silicon Valley, and they're now just about to refile with the FDA in the US, the Food and Drug um, Administration, to see if they can get clearance for use for this smart pill with this medication for schizophrenia and depression. And actually, you know, so if somebody's uh, not likely to keep taking their medication or they're going to stop, people want to know because it's dangerous, it's unhealthy, it's expensive if you stop taking your medication when you're not supposed to. So in real time, how do you feel, cool or creepy, that your medicine, your actual pill would have a chip inside of it sending information up to the cloud on when you've swallowed it? And then, when we think about connecting all these sensors to the internet, all these things collecting data about our health, right, in real time, all this being transmitted all over the place. But 
we heard recently this wanna cry, the ransomware, and it attacks a lot of organizations in the world. It cut off access to files, but in particular, the National Health Service in the UK got affected, and it prevented uh, doctors from accessing people's uh, medical records when they went in. So, you know, what does it mean when our bed is connected to the internet transmitting data? All these sensors are these, you know, we've got to start thinking when we, you build these solutions, this technology, are you thinking about cybersecurity in terms of the health data that you're collecting on all, all, all of us? And again, the Living Room Hospital. So this is a report published in the UK where they predict within five years' time, just five years' time, that the smart home, the connected home, will replace many of the healthcare services that are currently delivered by the hospitals, by the doctors in their offices. So think about that, that shift. What does that mean even as a side effect that I was thinking, what if you're in a small town and you have a taxi firm and there's a lot of old people in that town and one of the main sources of business for the taxi firm is taking the old people back and forth to the hospital for their checkups, right? Suddenly, they've now, you know, if people are, can be diagnosed and monitored in their own home and they don't need to go to hospital as much, then the taxi drivers, their business suffers. So again, there's winners and there are losers in this new arena. Symptom checker apps are going to, I mean, they're already here, they're being refined, so you have these three. Uh, you have Ada Health, Babylon, which I cited earlier, and YourMD. These are all being developed out of London. For some reason, when it comes to healthcare AI, London seems to be a hotspot in terms of leading the world for these new ideas and new inventions. Now think about this again. We might think, well, what's the big deal? You know, I've got access to a doctor. I can even phone a system and speak to a nurse. But think about those people living around the world who are maybe 100 kilometers away from a doctor, or they don't, they've never had access to a hospital because they're so remote, but they have a phone. Again, think about globally how your work in the future could affect people around the world. Now, we hear lots of hype about wearables. You have wearables promising that they can tell us when we're getting sick. We have uh, scientific studies trying to examine uh, what the predictive power of the data from wearables is. But I want to show you this chart up here. And this is from Ofcom in the UK. And they actually looked at people in different countries, not just in the UK or the US. And this was uh, October 2016. So do you use fitness monitors and smartwatches? So if you, you know, look at even the US, for example, it's just above, you know, 11, uh, you know, 10%. So one out of every 10 people are using these devices. So again, let's not get caught up in sort of the excitement that wearables will fix everything, but it was because very few people wear them, even now. And again, a reminder that not everybody uses smartphones. So this is a, another chart from Ofcom, but this is from uh, the UK looking 2012 to 2015. Smartphone ownership by age. So chances are, I would expect everybody in, in this audience today to be owning a smartphone, but you look at actually 65 plus, people who use the healthcare system the most. Even though it's gone up, it's still relatively low compared to younger people. So again, when we're thinking about, oh, an app for people who are older, will they use it because they might not be able to afford a smartphone or a data plan? I want to introduce you to the concept of immersive health. Now, 360 photos using 360 cameras like this one from Rico. Um, you'll start, you can now share these on Facebook, uh, you can share on Twitter, you can share on YouTube, you can create both uh, content which is uh, like a photo or a video. Now, the point of this is that it's changing the way we share and view content because imagine you're a elderly patient and you're living alone, and you're in a tough neighborhood, and you want to be able to show the healthcare system, the professionals, what your life is like. Imagine if you can just take a camera, somebody can come around your house, and you can create a 360 video showing this is what it, my life is like every day. And imagine when we think about all this data, videos and photos are data, why can't this, this content that we create be uploaded into our medical records so they get a more complete picture of our health? It's not just about clinical uh, measures such as our blood pressure or heart rate, but actually, what's our environment like? And 360 cameras potentially could be helpful there. And then, I want to talk to you as well when it comes to immersive health and virtual reality. How many actually have their own virtual reality headset of some kind? 
Okay, a couple of people, but I expect some of you, if you don't own one, you've tried it already. So you've got products such as the, the Samsung gear that you just put with your Samsung phone. Now, it seems like entertainment or a gadget or a gimmick. Many people just dismiss it as having no value in healthcare. But um, they've created ED, which again, in terms of immersing a doctor who doesn't know what it's like to be 75 years old and living with dementia, right, and getting old, put on the virtual reality headset, and you can allow them to step into the shoes of somebody living with that disease and getting old. So you can actually generate empathy for others using these virtual reality headsets. On the right is a, uh, in Australia where they've developed in uh, old age homes, they've de developed an experience where you can actually have a, a VR experience uh, in the care home. So again, they, you know, they can maybe visit, uh, an elderly person can, can visit somewhere that they uh, haven't visited for a while, maybe uh, you know, their knees hurt so much they can't uh, go hiking or they can't do something, so they can experience that in VR. And so again, think of that power, that immersive presence that this, what we, think of as a toy could be for people. And virtuality, the next 10 years, this is a friend of mine, he's a, a researcher out in uh, Los Angeles. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to take these consumer gadgets like the Gear VR, and he's trying to see, okay, well, clinically, so can scientifically, can you prove that they make an impact on someone's health? So in his small study in a hospital in the US, he's proven that it's impacted people's physical pain by having these VR experiences whilst they're in the hospital bed. Again, more research needs to be done, but again, think of how people are using and applying these emerging technologies that are available to everybody. Now, look at how much investment is going into AI in healthcare. So NVIDIA, the people who make these graphical processing units, these chips, they now say they've got this deep learning institute. You can go on there and there's online courses for deep learning. Um, it's free of charge. And they're hoping to train 100,000 developers in deep learning um, to bolster healthcare research. So think about these organizations wouldn't be investing this much long term if they didn't think that there was true value here. So again, I know many of us are bored by the headlines about AI and the hype and the machines are coming and they're getting smarter. But actually in healthcare, think how they could make a difference to you, your families, and your communities, to your nation, to the world. And this was actually last night, so when it talks about staying healthy, it's about understanding your diet. So at the moment, if you want to track how much you're eating, you have to use an app, and then you have to search for the food item and then select it or whatever. Um, so what if there was a way to just take a picture and the phone would recognize what food you're eating and know the calories, et cetera, and the portion size. So this was last night uh, with my, uh, the kind volunteers who took me to a local restaurant, um, and I ordered pink tuna. And I took a picture with the app. The app is called ByteSnap. It's available in the US Play Store on Android. And then I simply, as you take the picture, it then goes up to the cloud, gets the information, and says, OK, it comes up with predictions. Now, the first prediction, it thought it was Tuna, which is pretty good, right? So it means I've got one less step to do as a user. Then when I click on Tuna, then it says, OK, you know, this is what it guesses. It's um, you know, uh, medium portion, et cetera, one portion. So yes, you know, it doesn't get it 100% right. But the point is that this is just the beginning of a change in what we can do, what technology will allow us to do. I know Google are working on something similar where their vision is that you could just take a photo with your phone. You wouldn't have to do any of these intermediate steps. And the photo then would, the phone would automatically know the uh, nutrients involved, the calories, and store it in your, your, your phone. So there would, all you would have, you know, many people take photos already of their food and they put it on Instagram. So think about again how interesting this future could be. Conversational UI. So for um, this is where um, products like Amazon Echo here and Google Home, they've been launched, Google Home's in the US and the UK, uh, Amazon Echo uh, is in the UK, US and Germany, but they do have global plans. They're just you know, limiting the release at the moment. But these are changing how we interact. So I need a volunteer to come and test these with me. Who's uh, going to come and help me test these devices on stage? OK, please come up. Yeah. I heard people were shy here. And, and these have microphones that are always listening until you wake them up. But I've kept them switched off because obviously. 
because um, there is a, uh, people are scared that actually, what if Amazon and Google are just storing this voice data on the, in their servers in America and then potentially use it against us one day, right? So, Alex, welcome. This is a, a, a fellow speaker here at Login from England. We know each other. So what I wanted to just test and to show you um, is I, I'm just going to, um, so I want you to ask in your natural tone of voice, not to make any special uh, speech or anything, but I want you to ask uh, uh, Alexa and say, um, uh, uh, actually there's one skill I wanted to test, which is a doctor one for some kind of diagnosis information. So say, Alexa, ask Dr. Dex how to treat a burn. And you can just do it from there. Alexa, ask Dr. Dex how to treat a burn. Okay. So, uh, unfortunately, these live demos, it, it was working earlier, but the, the, the live demos are always problematic. Um, let's, try, um, let's try another one. Why don't you ask, uh, why don't you ask, Alexa, what is the weather forecast for tomorrow? Tomorrow in New York, there will be clouds with a chance of showers, with a high of 22 and a low of 15. Now, it's, uh, because it's the U.S. version, I've set it to my, my uh, a fictional address in the, in the U.S. Now, um, I want to show you quickly Google Home as well, because that allows you to access anything in Google search engine, the way you would type things, but you'll say it with your voice. So... Um, Alex, why don't you ask it where the nearest hospital is? Um, I haven't programmed it, I've just set it up. Um, and um, you just started off by OK Google. OK Google, where is the nearest hospital? I found a few places within 9.4 kilometers. The first one is Fossil at 29 James Street in London. The second one is Fossil Store Stratford at Westfield Stratford City Shopping Center. Uh, that was actually working for Lithuania earlier. For some reason, it switched back to <laughs> London. Um, and, um, and, and why don't you try asking Google a completely random question from a medical perspective? Think of the whatever you want, because it's a live demo. Just let's see how it works. OK, Google. What's the best way to measure blood pressure? OK, Google. <laughs> OK, Google. I think, uh, yeah. yeah it's, well, unfortunately, we're having technical problems. So give a big round of applause for Alex. Thank you very much. But trust me, these work. And I'm going to switch the mic off again. I don't want Google recording my talk. It's going to change how we access health information, how we access healthcare services. Now, again, you might think it's a gadget because you can ask this uh, to switch off your lights if it's connected to your smart home. You can ask for share prices, sports information, news. It can read your Kindle books, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is a really nice story from a chap called Rick Phelps in the U.S. who lives with dementia. And living with dementia is tough for the people who live with you. You're constantly asking, what day is it? What time is it? It creates a lot of problems and friction in a family. So he wrote, Amazon Alexa, the fact that he could just keep asking the time, etc., or what day it is, 20, 30 times. It never got tired. It never says, I can't be bothered to respond to you. For him, it gave him his memory, and it gave him ultimately dignity. So think about that, a $150 device from a a company in America called Amazon, and it's helping this person with dementia live with dignity. It's giving them some, a, sense of, a greater sense of independence to something that we, again, might think, this doesn't really have any value in healthcare, but it does. Now, cognitive health outside the hospital, and when I mean cognitive health in terms of our brain health, because, again, when it comes to healthy aging, Parkinson's, dementia, big, big challenges um, around the world, not just here in Europe. So you've got this cognition kit, it's a company in the UK, and they've showed that using consumer-grade wearables like an Apple Watch could generate meaningful data to measure your 
cognitive functioning in terms of how your brain is doing. Again, it's just early days yet, so it's not fully conclusive, but this is, this is where we're heading. VStore is where uh, a company, again, in the UK have developed a VR experience on a PlayStation VR to possibly augment or replace the current screening for dementia, where you have to go to the doctor's office, do some paper-based tests, you might do one on an iPad, but what if you're in your own home, you put on a VR headset, and you could be screened for early signs of dementia? I mean, think about how powerful that is, how that's reshaping everything. And then finally, and this is why our voice data, everybody's in a race, Google, Amazon, they're in a race to collect our health data globally. You know why? Because canary speech in the US, they're using voice data and developing algorithms to potentially detect, just from your voice data alone, whether you've developed early signs of Parkinson's or dementia. Think about that. Just me asking for the weather or where the nearest hospital is or sports scores eventually could lead to this global data, voice database. And then think about it. A pharma company, a university, a healthcare system are going to say, wait, who's got that data globally on all those people, the voice data? It's Amazon or Google. So think about all those opportunities. Now, the machines are getting smarter, right? That's what we're told. Or are they? This was when I was flying from Luton Airport on Wizz Air um, uh, yesterday, and my smartwatch, as I walk into the bathroom, decides to tell me that I need to be more active and that I haven't met to, I'm short of meeting today's active minutes goal. So again, when we think about these notifications and these nudges that they're going to nudge us into healthier living, they're still not that smart, they're not contextual, they're not relevant, and often they're not timely. And AI is everywhere. I have the world's first AI toothbrush. I was talking with Alex again at dinner last night. We were talking about the fact that I have a toothbrush, which is basically 40 pence of toothbrush. Uh, and yet I paid 150 euros for it because it's got AI. And uh, it monitors my brushing habits and gives me an update. And uh, what I found really weird is that my toothbrush is noticing that I'm brushing my teeth late at night and now trying to tell me that it could impact you know, my sleep, not having enough sleep or going to bed late could impact my health. And I thought, what the hell's going on with this world where we have all sorts of devices suddenly becoming nosy about and trying to nudge us outside of their core sort of proposition. So who wants digital nudges to stay healthy? Show of hands, what you've seen so far? Okay. Because you know what, it's not the majority who put their hands up, but this could very well be the future where it's forced upon us uh, in order to have these sensors for a, a, an employment contract because we're an airline pilot, they want to make sure we're healthy. It could be uh, to get access to life insurance, they want these sensors and this data in real time. Uh, it could even be the healthcare system saying, well, you know, if you're not going to wear a sensor 24 hours and get, give us this data, we can't keep treating you at low cost or for free. And the quest for artificial general intelligence, where these machines will become more intelligent or just as intelligent as us, we keep hearing it's going to be tomorrow, the day after. But actually, if you speak to a lot of experts in, in AI, they're talking about this, this big moment where these machines will become that smart. We'll probably be around the year 2050. So there are more basic problems to focus on now. It's just a reality check. We have to think about how we design AI. You know, so there are already groups that are looking at how, how we design AI, is it ethical? What are its values? You know, who's building, you know, who's building these tools and are they putting bias in these tools? Governments are interested. The US and UK government have published their own reports. Again, these algorithms are going to be running in the background with all this data from all these sensors, making decisions about whether we get that job or whether we get that beer at the bar. And again, who's building those tools? Who's introducing bias? And who can actually hold them accountable in this new century where you know, it's all about data and machine learning and the algorithms that are invisible to all of us? But they're playing that in, they've got this guiding hand in our decisions every day. Healthy aging. When we think about getting old and we think about compassion and kindness, we want, we want to be, you know, um, we want the human touch as we get old. We don't want to be left alone when we get sick. Yet, if you look at Silicon Valley, which has developed some great products, they're talking about curing aging. And they, put, you know, they think that basically the body is just software and hardware that you can reconfigure and you can, you know, potentially cure everything that ills us when we get old. 
This was launched yesterday by a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, Viome. So you've got these gut bacteria microbiomes, and now they're talking about using AI to track your gut bacteria too with these kits. Once a quarter, you take a sample from your gut and you send it off. So again, think about AI is permeating everywhere. And what about robots? You've got Paro, the robot seal for dementia patients again being trialed. You've got Pepper, which is one of the, the leading sort of humanoid robots in Japan. Um, and they're looking at, again, for dementia patients, one of the uses. And then you've got robots everywhere, to be honest, all over the place, so many different countries. Japan is probably leading the way in investment. But if you think about it, you know, do you want to be cared for by a robot when you get old? And obviously, it's going to be a long time before each of us gets old, but this is, again, potentially a way to make healthcare systems sustainable that, um, you know, put a robot in our house to look after us when we get old. I do have one robot on stage called Alpha 2 from China, about 1,500 pounds. Um, uh, uh, it's supposed to be really advanced. It can tell you stories, uh, keep your kids company, remind your grandparents to take their medications, etc., etc. Unfortunately, it's got Wi-Fi problems today, so it won't connect. <laughs> uh, but uh, could we play the YouTube video, please? Uh, I did record one earlier to show you it, that it was trying to teach me yoga. Can we have the sound as well, please? Sound? Can we turn, can we turn the volume up? It's not coming out on the stage, on the speakers. Okay, uh, we'll come back to that. All right, but can a robot provide empathy was this, was this great tweet, you know? So again, when we think about where we're heading and machines and humans and how we solve this global doctor shortage and how we do things, you know, I really want you to think about how you're gonna retain humanity in these new products, these tools and services that you build. When we think about empathy, I mean, I, I don't think that actually machines are capable of empathy, that these robots will one day show empathy and compassion for us. But some people do. Some people have put forward that in 15 years' time, you'll have these empathetic care robots. They believe there's even a company, Emoshape, that's building uh, a, an emotion processing unit, a chip, emotion on a chip, empathy on a chip. Do you really believe, would you trust a robot that feels sad when you feel sad? And then again, when we think about how we're designing these new tools and technologies, who we're involving, this was from, uh, this was in Singapore uh, uh, recently. MIT uh, organized a uh, hackathon to basically build a personal robot for older people. And they look at all the people that they invited, but nowhere on that list of people that they're calling to the event are the people that they're trying to build the products for. So again, this is very common, a lot of tech events, especially in healthcare, that patients, even their family members, the people who are caring for them, they're, they're, not, they're forgotten. They're not invited, they're not included. Which is why I really like this meetup that I went to in London where, look at the, the simple use of language. Instead of, de instead of saying designing for the dementia community, they wrote designing with the dementia community. It's about, it's about bringing people on this journey with you. So we get excited, we know about the tech, we know what we can do, but we need to bring people on that journey with us so that we build stuff that they need and that they want and that they love to use. Uh, is the video working? No, okay. But essentially, I, I mean, I can share it with you afterwards on t Twitter, but effectively, this that promises to teach you yoga and Tai Chi, as soon as it started lifting one foot off to uh, teach me yoga and do some pose, it then fell over backwards. So it's not going to replace a yoga teacher anywhere yet. So the question I have for you. In the year 2100, do we want the majority of healthcare workers to be humans or machines? And can machines really care? I'm still not convinced, even though there are people who believe it, that these machines here will one day be capable of, of caring for us the way another human being can care for us. And I like this um, 
these quotes here and the fact that if you look at healthcare systems, this is where they need your help. They're setting up digital transformation units, new programs, they're investing money, they're believing digital is the future, and they are just blindly digitizing the status quo. So they're taking a really crappy process in the hospital or um, in the doctor's office that's done on paper or done with a certain basic level of technology, digitizing it, and all, all you get is a nice shiny digital service that's launched at great expense but the underlying process, the underlying experience is still horrible, still needs work. So again, this is where you need the user experience designers to come on board when you are building your technologies. You need to really listen, you need to go out. So even if you're a software developer and you want to build something in health, I urge you, you know, you need to know as much about that person living with that disease or that health status as the doctor that you're co-founding your startup with, you know. So reach out to people, be curious. And I want to repeat again, everyone matters in this. So if you build new products that are going to help Lithuania's healthcare system and make it a sustainable healthcare system, make it the best in the world, you've got to make sure you include everyone on that journey. You really have to do that. And again, I feel through my personal experiences in life and through what I've seen, as much as I love all this new technology and I think it has great potential, and it has, has an impact to impact the health of seven and a half billion people who live on this planet. Whatever we build, whatever tools we design, let's do our best as a community to cherish and honor and retain the humanity that we currently have in healthcare. In fact, let's do whatever we can with technology to make sure that we have even more humanity in healthcare. So you see the example I said about the Amazon Echo and the chap living with dementia who said it gave him a sense of dignity, it gave him his memory. We've got to start thinking differently. You know, tech isn't always bad, it isn't always negative and going to destroy humanity, but we've got to be very careful how we manage that balance. And then finally, since I've got um, no robot video uh, to play for you, I just wanted to close on, on asking each of you in your hearts, for your families, for your communities, for your country, for, for the world at large, where do you want to go? You've seen a glimpse of, of where we are already, where we're going. Is that a future you'd like to be a part of? Is that what you'd like your children to experience as they grow old? Is that what you'd like your grandparents to be experienced? That just being tracked 24 hours a day and you don't have to even, uh, you know, you'll wait for your app to notify that your grandparent has fallen and you don't need to visit them all year round. Is that really the kind of society that we want to build? Is that a healthy society? It may have... Uh, it may make healthcare efficient, it may make it cheap, it may make it available to all, but is that how we want to live? Is that what we feel is best when it comes to our health? And finally, to reflect upon that question today, tonight over dinner, and tomorrow and the day after, what does health mean to you? Thank you very much.